before we start, I'd like to appeal to you to move forward. Let's cover the seats in the front. Thank you so much. Once again, good evening and welcome to the 95th edition of the Power Dialogue hosted by the Electricity Hub. We are happy to have you all here with us this evening. And without delay, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening. First off, we have Dafe C. Akbeneye. Commissioner Legal, Licensing and Compliance Division at the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Sir, please join us in front. Thank you. Next up, we have Osefan Anegbe, Associate, Energy and Natural Resources, Stream Sours and Corn. Ma'am. Next up, we have Dami Lola Alada, Associate, Bloomfield LP. Ma'am, join us. And uh, last but not the least, Atiku Jafar, Partner, Boyard Partners. He is our moderator for this evening, so please join us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, hand the floor over to Atiku. Here he goes. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, gentlemen and ladies. You're welcome to this edition of the Next Year Power Dialogue brought to you by Next Year Advisory under the Electricity Hub. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited to be on this panel, to be moderating this panel, uh, considering the the quality of the panelists that we have. So it's I, I could think of no greater order. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, really, especially because this is one gender balance panel. So give us a round of applause, please. So without much ado, um, we're diving straight into the business for today. Uh, we are we are discussing we're discussing the 2023 Electricity Act that was signed into law by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu on the 8th of June 2023. The Electricity Act we are all familiar with. It's one ambitious piece of legislation that had repealed and reenacted the 90, the 2005 Electric Power Sector Reform Act. And chiefly because, I mean, there was a lot of clamor for reform, for amendment. Uh, so it ushers in a new uh, legal and institutional framework for the Nigeria electricity supply industry. One of the, one of the key markers of the Electricity Act was that it effectively created a framework for decentralizing the regulation of electricity to state players. Um, decentralization was effected by the constitutional amendment prior to the enactment of the act. Uh, but I'm not going to speak um, much about that. I mean, uh, ambitious program for renewable energy adoption, um, the separation of, um, you know, distribution and electricity trading obligations in the sector, um, the unbundling of um, TCN, we, we are all going to hear the panelists discuss that uh, very, very keenly. Um, I have the the honor and privilege of introducing our esteemed panelists for today. Uh, first, we have no less than Mr. Dafe C. Apene. Dafe is the Commissioner for Legal Licensing and Compliance at the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Can you give him a round of applause, please? Second, we have Osefan Anegbe. Osefan is and associates at the Energy and Natural Resources Practice of Stream Source and Corn. Can you give a round of applause, Osefan? 
Also, fine. could you wave so they can see? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, third, we have Damilola Alada. Uh, she's an associate with Bloomfield Law Practice. Uh, doing great work, each of our panelists is doing an incredible work in the sector. Uh, so it's a great privilege to really have them here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so without without more to do, I think we're we're, we're diving we're diving straight. Um, first, uh, as is a tradition, uh, I'm, we're going to take opening remarks from our panelists. Um, just starters, do not really give up the the content of what you're here to say. Just an opening remark. Uh, say hi to the audience, just uh, a, a word or two about the Electricity Act and the Power Dialogue. Thank you. Uh, can we start with the regulator, please? So, okay, ladies first. Ladies first, it is. A uh, regulator says this, we, <laughs> we must obey. So, ladies first. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I don't know if this is working. Um, first of all, I would say thank you for having me here. Um, I'm very excited to be here um, to discuss this act. Um, for me, is this discussion is um, more like you know giving birth to a baby, and then celebrating one year anniversary, and then going back to look and say, okay, has this baby you know this growth so far? Did this baby teach properly? You know, is the baby crawling? Has the baby started walking? What are the things that you know have been done so far, and what are the things that we should be looking forward to as we grow? So um, this discussion um, today would really just give an overview, um, summarizing some of the things that have been done progress-wise, and then looking at areas of improvement or areas of growth or ongoing projects as well um, in the sector. So I am happy to be here, and I look forward to us delving into the power sector. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Osefa. And this is one interesting baby to, to look up to. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's <so>. baby. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, Commissioner Daffy. Okay. We'll do that. Damilola. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And just like uh, my co-panelist has said, I'm equally excited to be here. And um, there's also something I always say, which is if you ask every Nigerian or every average Nigerian as a, a power issue or an electricity issue story that they'll tell you, something that happened in their childhood that was related to no light, something that happened during adulthood that related to no light. And um, I, I think it's also best to describe electricity as backbone of infrastructure so whether now whether later topics around or issues around the electricity sector would always be something we'd have to discuss and just like she has already mentioned it's a baby that we have and we have really have to watch this baby grow and show that um the sector is is you know moving in the path that we really want and then in the next hopefully in, in the next few years we, we're getting closer to where we really want as as a sector for Nigeria. So yes, I'm also excited to look at key areas of the Electricity Act, see what we've done so far, and you know, let's see what what's coming in the next few months and years as well. Uh, th thank you, thanks a lot, Damilola, for for that, um, Commissioner Daffy. The floor is yours. Okay. Um. Good evening, everyone. And um, I, I must say, what gives me great pleasure is seeing young lawyers and joining the sector. Uh, from a capacity standpoint, we, we don't, we, we lack the depth of skills for uh, both legal and um, economic or electricity and electricity regulation. So seeing young lawyers take up that interest is a thing of joy. Um, I've had the great misfortune of doing this job for about um, eight years. Um, I started in 2017 and um, it's taken me from every other area of law to justice. Uh, so in 2017, after NERC, um I looked at the Electric Power Sector Reform Act because I read that thing back to front, back to front, back to front. And I told my colleagues, my fellow, my ch vice chairman, we didn't have a chairman, and my colleagues then that we can't superintend over an industry with this piece of legislation, that we need to have an electricity act that does this, 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 and that. And um, we, we took the 
House of Reps and Senate Committees of Power, respectively, for a retreat in Accra. And that's where we laid out the vision of what the act should do. And, um, you know, all things, government, government doesn't move at your pace. But we are grateful that within the time frame, um, our proposal was um, the vision, the necessary stakeholders keyed into that vision and the substantial objectives of what, what we sought out to do was achieved. And um, we'll, we'll expatiate further during the, during the sessions. And things were added, um, you know, like anything else, you don't cook on your own. So people yeah. added a few things into the, that we were not expecting, but um, we are way better than where we are, um, where we were. We're not where we ought to be, but we're way better. So it's a piece of legislation that um, we've looked at with um, introspection. And um, we really, we've not really done electricity regulation as regulation in Nigeria. And when you even look at the regulator itself, it's evolving. So the first set of commissioners, what they had to do is different from what the second set of commissioners had to do. is different from what uh, I'm doing. Even my first and second term, what I'm doing is even evolving. Absolutely. So things will evolve. And that's why I say with this evolution, seeing young lawyers who are interested, we know that everything's in good hands. Thank you very much, Commissioner Adafi. That was an interesting one. Uh, and I think it's very exciting to hear from the horse's mouth, um, the behind the scenes um, activities that, you know, ultimately piled up to the enactment of the act. Um, I, so I, I love your, after, your optimism. Um, I think it's best we, we look at the cup half full rather than half empty. We're not there yet, but I, I know that the Electricity Act, as you would believe, is an interesting piece of legislation that is going to probably give us the basis to reform the sector. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm still go going to stick with you, sir. Um, since the enactment of the Electricity Act in 2023, we have seen uh, significant strides in this sector. We have seen states like Ekiti, Enugu take like bold steps to enact their own markets and, you know, begin the process of transitioning of regulatory powers from NERC to the newly established regulators. Uh, we have seen a move to unbundle TCN by creating the, the independent system operator. Uh, but we have, we have also seen a bit of challenges. Uh, so in your view, what are the major strides, major successes achieved so far, uh, one year after, and what are the challenges? Okay, um, as a Nigerian, um, I will not give you a list of challenges <laughs> because um, being a Nigerian itself comes with its own unique set of challenges. But uh, I, I think it's good we we look at where we are coming from, right? Yeah. Um, a, a bit of um, context. We we've, we've we all grew up. At least my generation grew up complain about NEPA. And um, in 1999, we in Nigeria said, okay, let's have a different paradigm. Mm. And uh, when Obasanjo, when Obasanjo came into office, we knew that we had to do something about, about the power sector. And you should also be mindful that his own generation were the ones who, who built our major power infrastructure, the likes of Kainji, Igbin, they were the ones who built all that, laid the roadmap and built it. So they said, okay, what can we do differently? And set out a policy, policy document led to, let's have EPSRA. And we all assumed that the, the problem was generation. And um, we took on the, UK model of power sector reforms, right? Mm -hmm. Whereby set up a piece of legislation, create a regulator, unbundle, privatize. Privatize. Those four steps. Um, we did that, um, but we were, because we hadn't done 
power sector regulation before, we were focused on the reform, right? And you notice that the electric power sector reform, as I say, I say the reform in EPSRA, which should, it should be in all apps, because that was what the focus was on. But after we achieved the reform, we realized that um, it, it was a very inadequate piece of legislation to superintend over the power sector. The regulator that you had established had very limited powers. Um, the so, quite a few issues were not clear. Um, and you now address that with the um, political economy, right? Um, you, you see a sector like telecoms. Telecoms prioritization worked because President Obasanjo from day one said the political economy will not get involved in this industry, right? After, besides the sale of the licenses and they shared the money, right? They, they, we didn't put, put the money back, but no problem. Sadly. Right? Yeah. No, no problem. Um, investors will take risk if you allow them, right? And you don't get in their way. So they came in and there was no infrastructure anywhere. They had to build that infrastructure. And so they came in just at about the time I was becoming a lawyer, right? Mm. And in, as a new wig, MTN was the single largest buyer of diesel in Nigeria, right? They had to build that infrastructure across the country. But they didn't mind doing that because they could charge the tariff and nobody could argue, right, with, with, with them. And the institutions were strong. And Estunukwe was a respected and powerful regulator, his voice commanded something, right? Mm -hmm. And he was truly independent in every sense, right? You notice the, he once had an issue with um, Dora Kunyuli as mm -hmm. Minister of Communications mm -hmm. and the ruling was in his favor, right? So he was a strong- Independent. Independent. Although I say you truly can't be independent in government. Right, I say you can be independent, but you're not isolated. So it was a strong regulator. Um, you didn't have, other than the call for, we want um, per second billing, we didn't and port number portability. You didn't have any interference from the Senate, House of Reps. They allowed them to do their work. Civil society. So, yeah, let him, you know, there was, there was people there were complaints. In fact, customer complaints started from them. Okay. But from as a business, you were allowed to do your business. Now you juxtaposition that with the power sector, right? Um, all you know, power is a is a good campaign um, tool. You know, you can go somewhere, as my colleague would say, stand on your drum and say, "I will give you power," but nobody says. This power I'm bringing, you have to pay for it. So, so we find we are dealing with containing issues. There are many parts of Nigeria today that people believe that it is my gas. I don't have to pay for this power. It is our water. I don't have to pay for this power. We were displaced. I don't have to pay for this power. I'm a soldier. I don't have to pay for this power, right? And um, these are expensive resources, right? To to me. I'm a government agency. Good. <laughs> so 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 a lot of legacy issues, right? Um, um as a regulator, the commission wasn't empowered to deal with abuse, right? We would take certain actions. And um and the classic one that really did it for me was we'd come in and the board of Ibadan had done something very egregious. And we we suspended the board. I looked at the law and they said, my colleague said, we should remove the board. I said, no, we do not have the power to remove the board. That because we have a fiduciary responsibility, let us suspend the board and tell the directors to appoint another set of, of people, you know? 
that was a big issue. You know, National Assembly were at House of Reps. They said we will overturn that. They took us to court. Um, judgment was given in favor of the battle at the Federal High Court. We only just got judgment in our favor at the Court of Appeal last month for an event that happened in 2017. But that is even fast by Nigerian standards because it's not a political issue. Yeah, yeah. So the regulator was, was, wasn't empowered by law to do many things, right? Um, the, a lot of political interference, uh, a lot of pushback, and you didn't have the tools of deterrence to do what you had to do as a regulator. Uh, so we've, we've sought to address a lot of those things in the Electricity Act, and you could see that from 1st January 2024, we started the year with an order whereby we swept off the um, board of Cardinal Disco, Disco, right, for failure. And anybody who read that order would see that, look, there's nothing the other covered the field, right? And the commission had been empowered to do what it's supposed to do, you know? Um, and the legislation brings, it codifies, which is one of the things we want. So you don't want to be reading, oh, I want to know about NEMSA. I'm going to look for one law. I want to know about uh, no, uh, the hydro... Hyperdeck. Hyperdeck. So we, we put everything in one in one place. Uh, and it gives you um, the the vigor, right, to do what you you need to do. So things things are evolving. Um, like I said, we are we are not there here, but we're way better than um, than where we where we're coming from. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that, that was that was a very detailed insight, taking us down memory lane. Um, what used to uh, prevail in the past. Um, I think one one takeaway from his comment was that the Electricity Act had created a framework for the regulator to assert their regulatory powers to superintend over the industry, um, and that there were no loopholes to exploit whenever the regulator handed down its regulatory decisions. Um, second, the Electricity Act was responsible for harmonizing all the bits and pieces of legislations, um, NEMCO, NEMSA, HyperDIG, and, and what have you. Uh, th thank you very much for, for that insightful uh, contribution. So I I move quickly to you, uh, Osefan. Um, we, we both know the, the complexity of, um, you know, seeing policies through to implementation. Uh, from your experience uh, with the policies that we've had in the sector in the past, not really so much of them, in what ways do you um, envision the act and the integrated national electricity policy and, and strategic implementation plan? In what ways do you envision the act and this policy to you know, align with the broader goals of efficiency in the sector? So um, I would say that one, um, in the past, we've had inconsistency, right, with policy reforms. Um, you could date it back to um, President Passenger's regime, um, where he had um, put out the policy. And then when when we got to, when President Tulok Jonathan took over, it was suspended, right? And you've had inconsistencies here and there up until President Buhari's, um regime as well. Um, you've also had, you know, injunctions being given, you know, when certain policy, certain actions are being taken by the court. So uh, with this um, Electricity Act, right, um, it has provided that the Ministry of Power, I mean, alongside stakeholder engagements, to come up with uh, an in integrated national electricity policy and strategy implementation plan. And what that um, policy is supposed to cover is ways for which um, we can optimize the use of energy sources, right? Um, gas to nuclear to coal and then renewable energy sources. I mean, definitely. And it has also, um, it should also cover things that um, border around rural electrification, um, private public part um, partnerships in rural electrification infrastructure um, and so many other um, areas, right? That border around um, 
expansion of the development of the sector from um, the entire value chain. And I, I haven't, I mean, we haven't seen a copy of the policy yet because it has not been drafted. Um, the Ministry of Power has had several um, stakeholder engagements as well. Um, there has been a retreat, there was a retreat in December um, with stakeholders. They've also had draft consultation papers, right? And we believe that the plan is that that policy will be presented to the Federal Executive Council in September. And I hope, right, we, I mean, we are, with what the actors provided, we hope that that policy will be comprehensive enough, right, to further promote or encourage implementation of the act because the act is holistic, right? The act provides for um, the integration of renewable energy. The act provides for state decentralization, like like we said. The act provides for the entire value chain. It has it has given you provisions that allow for private um, investments to come in. It has given you provisions that allow for the protection of these investments as well. So the policy um, would cover areas that would promote this. I mean, usually you would have that policies would precede law, right? Because policies are strategic documents, right? That, you know, are set to, they set, they set out objectives and goals for which um, laws now, laws being legal instruments can enforce those objectives or those goals. Um, however, we, we find that we have a law already, right? That has now provided that a policy should be drafted within a year and then should be subsequently reviewed and ensuring that stakeholder engagements um, are covered, right? You in, in, in all through through this all through the step three. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Just just as a follow up, yeah. you you mentioned the the the, the efforts to optimize renewable energy sources into the energy mix. Yes. Um, some might argue that Africa contributes less than. 4% of global carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this whole thing with the Electricity Act, um, creating renewable energy portfolio obligations, you know, feeding tariffs uh, that probably might be seen to discriminate against our abundant fuel source that is natural gas? Okay, so I'll say that um, one, looking at our history right, um, yes, we, we have abundant resources of gas. I mean, it's even, it's it's funny that we are even discussing gas supply deficiency in Nigeria <laughs> with how much we have, <laughs> with how much gas reserves that we have. But we've also noted, I mean, we, we all know that Nigeria generates, last I checked, um, about 3,500 to 4,500 megawatts that is being fed into the national grid, right? Which is not sufficient for the 200 million people. And so if we're discussing renewable energy, there is a global trend to transition you know, from the fossil fuels, and that's because of the environmental implications that they have, right? But it's also because it, for us, it also, it, besides just um, moving around, um, moving or complying with global standards, it's also to ensure that we have enough generation, we have enough power generation, you know, that would efficiently give Nigerians um, reliable power supply. So yes, um, there is need to promote renewable energy, right? There, there is um, there's so many other um, reasons, which is the reliability of that. I mean, if you're if you're discussing production, um, gas production, and you're discussing what um, hydro, solar, the reliability of gas supply versus the reliability of knowing that we have so we have sun in abundance, right? We have hydro, so we have some of these other um, energy sources that you don't need the traditional fossil fuels in order for you to generate power. So the act has done a great job with ensuring that, you know, distribution companies, generator companies also get feeding from renewable energy sources. And I and I, and I think that that's, that's a very positive. Thank, thank you very much um, for, for that really interesting one. Um, I think I move to you, Damilola. Um, Damilola, the, the Electricity Act, has created an environment for states to license new entrants and regulate the, the market at the state levels. Um, so knowing that infrastructure investment is critical to enabling whatever is envisaged by the act to take place. Um, and, you know, considering, uh, you know, what we see all over the place, uh, the states lacking transparency in procurement, the states lacking um, adherence to contract, the states like in the capacity to attract you know, investment. So what, what, what steps do you think the state should take to attract investment, bankable investment, bankable projects in this space? Uh, 
I'm not sure. Can, can you speak to the mic? I think there's a technical issue with the mic. Okay, thank you very much yeah. for that. And I like the fact that um, you started with the state because now with the Electricity Act, the government is no longer the federal government. Now you have to always involve the state government as well. Now when you have, speaking of projects and I'll take, I'll start from infrastructure and projects. Now, there's so much focus on, you know, thermal sources of electricity generation in Nigeria, whereas, um, to combined total install capacity for if you had um Kanji Jeba Shiro, you have up to about 1,900 megawatts, but we don't even use up, we don't even act available capacity is not up to that. Even as a country, uh, recently the minister had mentioned that Nigeria wants to pushing to have up to 6,000 megawatts. Now, the reality is total installed capacity is way above that, but what is really available is less than that. Now, that brings us to the first point, which is we need to diversify the sources of electricity generation. Now, hydroelectric, hydroelectric power plants will be a good way to look at it. And for each state, the good thing now is each state can actually look inward, see what is best for your state, and see what you can, what resources do you have in your state that you can adopt? Now, the reality is not all states are going to be able to move at the same at the same pace. Now, some states are evidently more uh, financially capable and buoyant than others, but the, the goal is the state is closer to the people. You know what the needs of your people are, and then you can tailor projects with financiers, with other interested stakeholders to focus on projects that will work for your state. Now, the other thing is the transmission. No matter the amount of generation we have, if we're unable to wield that electricity, then that's another problem entirely. Now, this year alone, the national grid has collapsed, I think, about five or six times. In the last 10 years, over 100 times. Now, that is a serious problem. If, if we don't find a way to actually deal with issues of transmission, then we're back to... It's almost like we're running in the same in a in a circle. So we need to also states also need to find a way to deal with issues of transmission. Now the truth of the matter is, presently we're all still the national grid is still there. A lot of people are. If we take for instance in Lagos State, a lot of there are so many estates in Lagos State now. There are you know off grid arrangements and all of that. For transmission purposes, each state will need to find or let's say as a country or in terms of projects and infrastructure we need to actually look about think of how we're going to have transmission the grid upgrades enhancement maintenance yes there's this um creation of this separate the iso now hopefully that would also you know help to streamline obligations and focus on good things that would help to improve this transmission um, aspect of electricity generation and another thing which states would also need to look at is collaboration and that is very key for where we are now the beauty of the decentralized arrangement is the government has or put it this way the federal government has sort of finally quote and unquote opened up the the market opened up opportunities for people to take advantage of it and that is something that everybody will have to look at another one is the low hanging fruit Distribution is probably the lowest angry fruit that states can look into. They're closer to the people. They can find, um, for instance, issues around methane, using of technology, local enforcement. Those are things that the state can also look into. And with things like this, they are, they, they, if you have a good package, investors are, there's one thing which is which you would learn from advising clients, particularly in the private sector, is once they are able to, ensure that within this period of 20, 30 years, they're going to actually make recoup their investments with um, the kind of profit they, are, they, they want. They are willing to actually find a way to navigate through some of the issues or challenges that they may face. So if you have this sort of collaborations, you have, um, you allow the states, each state's number one collaboration, you allow them to also have um, access to some to some some of funding with backing from the state government, and then you also have um, areas that the state can look into. Maybe start from distribution and focus on some project around there. 
I think it, it would generally help the, the states to move along really fast as well. That was an excellent one. We'd love to cut you there. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, so quickly moving on to, to Commissioner Duffy, um, a, clear, a clear regulatory environment is at the heart of all of this. For us to attract the desired investments into the power sector, uh, investors would be interested in the sort of, you know, policy framework in place, the regulations in place, and most of all, the policy support from the regulator. Uh, so in what ways is the government planning to provide that level of support, that level of tailored support for investors seeking to come into this market? Okay, so um, I, I think from, from an investment standpoint, right, investors aren't really bothered about your law policy. It's not the central thing. What investments? The first thing that investors are scared of is, is the government slash political risk. Because um, the, the mindset of government is different from the mindset of the private sector. So um, government, we, we, are, we are selling public goods. Right, yeah. hinge on welfare and security. The um, private sector is profit driven, so you want to give the largest amount of return to your um, stakeholders, your investors. So, um, where you can, the first thing. You, investors want is they need to understand and appreciate that government will act in a certain way, right? And my classic example, which I always use, it's um, some gentleman wanted to start a um, Okada business in, in Lagos. And they go to Lagos. At the launch of the business, the governor of the state was wearing their T-shirts, holding their helmets. Right? Yeah. Three, four months down the line, Lagos State banned that. That was done. <laughs> right? Banned it because public good, right? Bikes are becoming a security imminent and blah, blah. blah. So, mm. so government acts on the basis of public good. So juxtaposing public good and, and profit. So having a framework whereby they know that um, government would would act in a certain way that you would you are measured you are considerate and there's there's a process to your decision making secondly you have an environment that guarantees the return that that business was established for right so i go back to my gsm example right from day one they started off with a very high tariff of 15 naira. You bear in mind that the exchange rate then was about 80 naira or 100 and something, 110 or so to a dollar. So we're paying about 50 cents, right? For a minute. So if you know what 50 cents now, 50 cents is about what? 750 naira. 750 naira to, to make a call, right? To show you. So having that framework that knows that, okay, this business, we've set it up to make money. You will ensure that we are able to make money, right? You, will, you won't tell us that um, because Excel doesn't lie, right? Once you plug those numbers into Excel and you do those modeling and projections, they will tell you that we have to do this for this number of years and projections. By, by year three, year four, we will break even yeah, five, we'll start to do, you know. And if you're making those projections, you now have expansion plans built, built on those projections, right? Um, so the best thing you should you are able to do, the most critical policy decision you can make in any power sector has to do with end-use tariffs. Um, 
it's the power cycle is a coordinated really, right? Generation to transmission to distribution. And there's only one source, right? Electrons go downstream, cash, cash flows upstream. upstream, right? And that cash comes from end use customers. So if you don't have certainty, right, on how that cash moves upstream, you're not going to do anything. So it's not a function of coal. It's not a function of energy source. It's not a function of renewables. It's not a function of anything, right? And when people talk about the sector, most people don't appreciate the, the financial implications of the power sector. It's, it's, it's heavy industry that's driven by project finance, meaning we expect the asset to fund itself, right? Yeah. And when you look at the cost outlay, so we like to throw out numbers, right? That, oh, we need 100,000 megawatts, we need X amount, but, but people don't appreciate the fact that, and you're doing infrastructure now, for every one megawatt you hear, in the nameplate capacity of a power plant, that is 500,000 to $1.5 million for every megawatt, just on, on the plant on its own, right? Um, one of the panelists spoke about gas. Gas pipelines are not cheap to build, right? So, so you, that's also, if you look at um, gas pipelines, there's a cost per kilometer of, of pipelines, right? And it's even worse, um, the um, gas side of the oil and gas industry is even worse because the kind of machines they use are not as rugged as the machines you use for oil production, right? The machines are very sensitive, whereby low tolerance, it's like you, you they have to be very clean. So On him. these are, these are, crucial cost, right? We spoke about transmission and, oh, the grid collapsing, right? To run your grid, right? One kilometer of 330 kV, just one kilometer, that's a million dollars. If it is um, um, 132, that's $400,000. Convert $1 million to, to Naira. So you start to appreciate the, the cost, right? It's not as if this cost are uh, that prohibitive when you look at our the demand and you look at the demographics. But where you, you put the overlay of the political economy and people believing that um, the cost for the power sector is not a cost that should be appreciated. It's not a cost that should be recognized and members of my dear profession, we are getting injunctions against a tariff review. And I'm seeing three tomatoes for 8,000 air, right? Yeah. Three tomatoes, three. And if you can't make an omelet with three tomatoes, right? For 8,000 air, right? There's nothing in Nigeria today that the price we pay is 2022 prices. So if you do not, the most serious thing you can do from an enabling standpoint, and utility business is, you will never be a Fortune 500 company. You will never be a Dangote, right? Or the leading company in the country. But you will be a business that performs well and makes the returns because you're shielded from all the cost. Right? You've been shielded from, and your inputs are there, the margins you can make, are, are, that's what the regulator family does, right? So you need to have a framework whereby you guarantee that return. And that return is the end use time, right? Where you can have a consistent flow of saying that the tariff for this month is X, there's no noise. 
about it, people pay, right? The tariff for next month is why there's no noise, people pay. Sorry, I'm getting signals to interrupt you, uh, okay. but, but just but just as a follow up, I mean, yeah. I'm really curious about the point that you raised on the the cost structure that underpins the generation of power um, and the need to set cost reflective tariffs. And now that we are we are seeing the Electricity Act enabling transition of regulatory powers to the state decentralization, if, if you may. Um, we the kind of the, the sort of um, credit guarantees that have been rallied around Azura IPP when they were coming upstream, considering that it's a product financed, one hundred percent product financed power plant. Um, do do you think the state have the capacity to provide that level of guarantees? I know that you might be caught on newspapers answering this, but in thirty seconds you can. Okay, so the point is, I'm not going to speak to Azura. Yeah. But what I would say is um, each jurisdiction develops its own transaction models. And we've rightly seen that the um, copy and paste transaction models given to us by the UK law firms um, may not necessarily work for us. And sure. um, you, you, that's why you've seen us evolving into energy-only PPAs and, and, and things like that. So the issue is that... Um, each state, the beauty of it is that each state now, the benefit of the transition is that the end use customer tariff no longer becomes a national discussion, right? So if my state's delta charges the tariff that this is our cost effective tariff, go and pay. We're not adding anything to it. It's a discussion in delta states. Right, so you are not having it's no longer a national discourse that you're going to have at the national assembly, and because it's not a national discourse, um, people can evolve at their own pace, right, and do the things that work for them. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much for that. The ability of states to set their own tariffs and the leverage that comes with you know getting some relief off the shoulders of net. Um, so that's that an interesting one. Um, Osefan, I'll, I'll move to you quickly. Uh, considering your experience in stakeholder management, what practical steps, just in two minutes, what practical steps do you think states can implement to act and retain investment into this sector? I mean, we're looking at huge projects that are highly capital intensive and are expected to you know, make returns based on future project cash flows. So what can states do? Practically. Okay, thank you. So um, I'll draw from my experience with working with some of the governments uh, on how to advise and to, you know, write laws, stream laws and so on. Um, practically, I would say that to benefit from what this act has provided and what the constitution has provided, know your market, right? Um, just like Commissioner has said, um, it's capital intensive and it, it requires a lot of technical expertise but you need to know your market. You need to identify whether you actually have an electricity market that is viable in your state, right? Even though the law has provided for that um, um, transitional provisions and then the rest, it has not mandated, mandated you to do that until you are ready to. So first, do your market feasibility studies, right? Know that, you know, understand that you have a, an electricity market, know what that is. Secondly is um, create policies, right? Regulations as well that will encourage investors. Those policies can provide for tax breaks, can provide for um, holidays, can provide for in incentives, right? Um, the electricity sector, the power sector, it's an entire value chain. So you can actually encourage investors that have shown interest or that actually have the capacity, the financial capacity and the technical know-how, right? To invest in those um, specific chains. So, Supply, distribution, transmission, even manufacturing of elect um, electricity equipment, cables, meters, and the rest, so that we are not um, solely reliant on um, imports, right, and foreign exchange. Um, I think that states can do that, right. Um, so, quick one: market feasibility. Not, not understand the market. Secondly, um, set up laws and policies that um, are business friendly, right. Um, thirdly, also collaborate with your local governments. They are the ones that are closer to the end users, collaborate with your local government. 
um, collaborate with the federal government as well so that we have um, some sort of, because investors also want to know that um, there's, a, there's a standard, you know, you have 36 states. Imagine having 36 different laws that speak to the same thing. So they want to know that there's, there's a standard that cuts across board nationally, right? That's, that's another thing that you can do. Um, last but not the least, because of time, invest in human capacity development, invest in research, right? The sector is, yes, um, very capital intensive, but it's also very heavily reliant on technical know-how. You need to know. I mean, I mean, you can't put in people who don't even understand what it, what it means to have tariffs. You know, it's not just to interpret laws, instead of policy. <laughs> yeah. They need to know, you know, how is power being generated to start with? You know, how is it being transmitted? You know, how is it, you, you need to invest in people that I understand mean, that. So that's that's what I would say for states. And, you know, awareness, is, awareness is key, considering a lot of Nigerians still think that power is a public good uh, today. Uh, that, that's very, very startling. Um, she, she spoke about market feasibility, um, regulatory mastery, implementing incentives for, for stakeholders, and for just, licenses. And just to quickly add, um, you can also encourage investors, very importantly, to invest in renewable energy and in mini grids as well. There, I mean, the act provides for that. State laws can provide for that, where you have invested mini grids that provide for powers in you know small areas and then you don't have to rely on one transmission line or grid. So I think that that's, that's my addition. Absolutely. Modular yeah. generation uh, establishment. Like uh, I already uh, have. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, at this point, we have our esteemed audience online, uh, join us online. And uh, we picked a question from, from David on Zoom, if David can hear us. Uh, David wants to know what the specific provisions are for incentives within the Electricity Act designed to promote and facilitate the growth of renewable energy project in Nigeria. What are the incentives uh, that aim to promote or facilitate the penetration of renewable energy in our energy mix under the Electricity Act. Um, I'll, I'll leave it open. Who wants to go? Sure. Okay. sure. Then. Okay, I think this is back on now. Um, so in terms of incentives, uh, one of the things we've already said is is a capital intensive um, industry. Now for renewables, one of the things you can have is um, tax waivers for some of these equipment that you're bringing in. You can get um waivers. There's the import duty exemption um certificate you can get for some of those um equipment that you bring in. Also, there are other um benefits that and yes, that's another thing I want to mention, which is mini grids, for instance. Now, it's a very, very good thing for good option that states can consider. And one of the things, ways that the states can help with that is give access to land. That's another very good incentive that the state can have. Also, the state can also work with um, distribution companies that work within or they are, you know, they are going to be operating within their state to find a way to also give some sort of energy credit to, you know, certain users and all of that. Those are some of the uh, or innovative ways that, you know, there can be some form of incentives for people um, that are, you know, contributing or using renewables and all of that. Thank you very much. One one aspect that caught my attention is given access to land. Um, I know that the the Transmission Company of Nigeria and the NDPHC has been battling with you know a floodgate of lawsuit, way leave issues, um, right of way um, claims. Uh, so if the states can address issues of land access, that would go a long way in attracting investment. Uh, thank you very much. So at this stage, we've had a very patient audience. Uh, I can see from the faces they're waiting to to ask questions to our panelists. Uh, so I'm, we're going to open the floor to questions from the audience. We can take two or three. Uh, gentleman in black, Muntasir, I see you. <laughs> can you pass the mic to Muntasir, please? Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the insight. My question is to Commissioner Daffer. Um, few... okay. Could, okay. could you please stand if you don't okay. mind? A um, few years back when there was issue at um, with the on Disco, I think everybody blamed it on the um, 
gaps in the law actually, APR, the EPSRA at the time. So, and post EPSRA, when we saw um, issues in Eco Disco a few months back, and, um, you know, it was a directive from NERC that was misinterpreted for personal reasons or whatever. And um, we saw how it led to even the MD losing her job and everything and how the whole matter was really handled. And a lot of people in the sector have read a lot of commentary and people are saying, as it's still like actually NERC as well, that's saying is either NERC was not really assertive as a regulator because at some point they expected when the matter was when it became so bad, the relationship went bad and it would be, you know, it was a negative. Like I said, commission, I'm sure you're aware of the whole situation more than I am. So, but like I said, most people are blaming you know, Well, people are saying the regulator has not done so much in actually um, addressing the whole issue. So can we also put it on the law as well? Is it a law issue this time around or is the regulator, as the regulator's inability to actually address um, his own stakeholders. Thank you. Oh, okay, so um, you you um, you spoke about issues, right? Okay. Um, there's if you know how boards work, right? You you are an aide to someone in national assembly, so <laughs> so I I I, I think. I think you you are familiar with the concept of coercive vibration, right? That where you have two or three people gathered, rep from Joss, rep from this place, rep from that place, and they want to make a decision. They don't all say, oh, this decision we want to make. And everybody says, yes, oh. we agree with that decision. Does it work like that? Oh. Good. So that's disagreement process is an integral part of decision making right and um, a regulator's job right is not to say oh um, there are disagreements and I will show up I'm not your mom right even at a certain stage right? When you and your brother are having a heated argument, your parents even ignore you until you now say something that is, they were, oh, no, 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 we don't talk like that in this house. You understand? Because they, they, they appreciate the fact that you need to learn to disagree without being disagreeable, right? So regulators would only intervene in a board, right? Where that disagreement, poses a systemic risk to the operation of that business, right? And I'll give you, it happens in, in banking sector. I won't mention banks, but there are banks that they recently changed, a, an MD just got appointed now of one of the major banks. But before that decision was made, there were disagreements on the board. Did the CBN say, uh, you go? No, right? You, you need to allow, so your reg, a regulator's job is not to micromanage, right? And what makes the difference between different boards is how you're able to innovate and on the basis of your decisions. So you had a decision, right? You had things that were going on that posed a systemic risk to the institution. And that was the only reason the regulator intervened. And once that problem got taken out, you had staff were threatening to go on strike, unions, all manner of petitions flying here and there that would affect your ability to do your work. When the fundamental decision was taken, right, did that issue still persist? No. So it, it's not it's not um, it's not the regulator's job to come and impose a dress code, right? Or to say, oh, um, you were not you, these two people are not talking. There are boards where the board members don't talk to themselves; they can't get along, 
and in the environment you are working to, you are probably some members too who, who don't get along, right? They see themselves in the corridor, they don't even say hello to themselves. But when they get into the chamber, right, they will vote on the same issue that aligns on their interests and vote against the same issue that um, is not in line with their interests. So it's a staying big picture, right? Why do you exist? And ensuring that you are scared to do that which you exist for. Um, saying that you will have um, disagreements. You will always be disagreements. And on a fundamental issue, classic example, when um, there was a certain Senate president not too long ago who didn't agree with the president. You understand? Two arms of government. You know? But what happened? He, he served out his term, didn't he? You understand? So that issue of um, people disagreeing, is it a bad thing? Right? But the issue is, can you disagree without being disagreeable? And even when you are disagreeable, does it bring the house down? It is when your being disagreeable wants to bring the house down. That is when someone like us will come in and say, eh, this house is bigger than all of you. Right? Pack your bags and go elsewhere. So um, people have to be allowed to um, have their disagreements. And um, it's not for the regulator to start. You understand? So the regulator is always big picture, right? Big picture focused on the entire value chain. Thank you very much. That is one regulator's wisdom we've got there. Can you disagree without being disagreeable? Can you give me a round of applause, please? Many thanks indeed for that. Just a quick one, we're rounding up. For, for those, I'll get back to the audience, please. For those joining us online, you can quickly drop your questions um, under the Q&A section and, and they'll be passed on to us. Um, so uh, can I take can I take a lady first? The lady in tan, yeah. All right. Okay, so my question is for Osefan. Oh, I don't know who talked on capacity building. Um, I think it was you. Okay, so that, that um, I mean, capacity building is is very important in this um, sector. I, I mean, I'm in the sector as well, and I, and I know how integral that particular um, area is. And you know, you were talking about how capacity building can actually help states and all. So I don't know if you can just elaborate on that a little bit, how states can you know, um, putting, I don't know, maybe initiatives. Yeah, you also talked about research. So I don't, because I don't see much of that. That is why. Um, so uh, maybe you can just elaborate, maybe how states can actually tap into stuff like this. Maybe they need to build in small schools or something like that, because trust me, the knowledge is quite like, is needed. There are a lot of, the setup is filled with so many branches that even, I mean, a lot of people are not even open to right now, but I believe, this capacity building is something that will help with that. So, yeah. Yes, Osefan, can you take that in a minute? A minute, Please. okay. So I'll just draw from what um, I see that NEC has been doing, right? Um, NEC um, held a stakeholder collaboration with states, um, with states, and the idea was to educate them, right? And just educate them on how to regulate Right and just share experiences of what they've been doing, and they did that also with the um, NJC. That's the judiciary, the judiciary, because um, we noticed that um, Commissioner had talked about an injunction. You know, he didn't speak in detail, but an injunction, injunction that NEC had um, received based on the tariff review, right? And I saw that they they went ahead to you know do like an electricity one hundred and one, right? Because even for yeah. investors as well, you want to be sure that your dispute resolution mechanism is working in a way that. If anything happens to my investment, you know, I can come to the judiciary and get some recourse. So for states, having seminars and workshops like that are good, but it's going to schools as well, right? Because in the end, these things will be run by people. It's human beings, right? Um, REA did something with STEM girls um, in partnership with, I think, um, I'm not, I can't remember which, who they collaborated with. And it, they went to the University of Abuja to train young girls, um, undergraduates, on how to use um, certain things engineering-wise. And I think that you can do that, right? 
states can also invest in that they are universities you can invest in that you can invest in trainings as well right you can collaborate with with the private sector um there's so many um funding that goes into research um in other jurisdictions you have companies collaborating with universities for research some of the top schools ivy league schools that you have is, is research you know so you can collaborate with private investors to in to do that as they are maybe csr you can do that you know in universities you can do that for young engineers young lawyers um environmentalists because the sector is it's broad. It affects different areas beyond engineering. There's environmental, there's health and safety, there's legal, there's commercial. It's it's broad. So you can collaborate with businessmen, the investors that are coming in. You can collaborate with universities. You can collaborate even with NEC as well, right? There's so many other areas, but my moderator has given me one, <laughs> one minute. So those are those are steps that steps um that's the states can take as well. Thank you. I think I think Damiola wants to tip in in, in okay. 30 seconds. Okay. Can you one more thing I would like to add, which is in terms of local enforcement. Now states can help by setting up um like tax forces for each state. Now look at how traffic works. How do you ensure compliance with traffic? Take a state like Lagos State. If you get caught, I think you all day can actually get disrupted. Letting any of the and anything like that on as seriously as that, so that we the people we begin to actually monitor and regulate on ourselves. You see, someone there are lots of bypass electricity theft and all of that until we actually have some level of consciousness as a people to understand that this thing you're paying for it is utility, yes, it's welfare and all of that. But the state would really help with having such um, tax forces. Those tax forces would trust me, they would do the sensitization. Many thanks, yeah. many thanks indeed for, for that contribution. Many thanks indeed. Capacity building, um, a lot has been said. Um, I believe your question has been answered uh, satisfactorily. Um, knowledge transfer is critical, and you know, the development of talent in you know early career professionals, student educators. Um, I, I know that there are many outfits doing the same, the youth energy summit. I mean, excellent work. Um, so that is the way to go. C can we take um, maybe a final question from the audience? Okay. Okay, I think let, let's take that one first. Let's take that one first. It's been... Good evening. Uh, my question is for Commissioner Dafe. Okay. And, um, you know... And spoke... please endeavor to make it a question because... We... Yes, yes, of course. He spoke about uh, that when he first joined, you know, he looked at the EPSR Act and said it wasn't suitable. And, you know, when you read the Electricity Act, one part that strikes me that was retained from the EPSR is the PCAF, Power Consumer Assistance Fund. <laughs> and, you know, you, a member of your team is here. I've harassed him severally. And I said, you know, this is a good time to ask. It has not taken off for 19 years now. And it was retained. So if you retained it, what, you know, steps are you taking to ensure? Because subsidy, we can't take away the rule of government also. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy you asked that question. And, and um, at the height of COVID, we, um, with the, then, he, he wasn't speaker then, the chief of staff was the um, house leader at that point in time. Mm. And we went for a meeting at the National Assembly and um, they asked the question about PICA. So what's the Power Consumer Assistance Fund, right? It's a subsidy for the vulnerable um, customers, right? In the value chain. Okay. So I take it you understand how subsidies work, right? So if you have a subsidy for a segment, it means that only that segment is being subsidized and the rest of us from what we are paying, right? we can carry you, right? But where you have a scenario where all of us in this room are being subsidized. No, 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 right? When you have a scenario where all of us in the room are being subsidized by, let me use the Nigerian parlance, we're all government speaking, right? Who are you now subsidizing? Who are you now having pick up for, right? 
So that is the that, that is why you've not had pickup in, in 19 years, right? But do we need pickup? Yes. Um because there's a vulnerable side of society. But before we get that, so the work towards establishing pickup is being done. But to achieve that, to land that, the rest of us who are not vulnerable should pay the going cost, right? And are you a lawyer? Okay, good. So with the, with the amendment to the act now, if you read it clearly, you, you would appreciate the fact that the federal government no longer has responsibility for distribution. If you read the constitution, right? Mm. The first schedule in, I think, paragraph 14, federal government generation transmission, right? Second, this following schedule for um, states is distribution, generation, That's transmission, right. distribution, distribution, because distribution is deemed to be a local issue. So the federal government will only have responsibility for SCT until SCT decides to create its own regulator, right? So it means all those local issues that are in the EA, that you have a responsibility on the federal government, right? Because we amended the constitution and the EA without the teams were not working together, right? But the constitution supersedes, right? So you are now all those local issues, right? Are are no longer the responsibility. So if you look at um, the ABIA law, they've made provision for their own PCAF, right? So because they are the ones who are dealing with end use customer issues. So those issues will not get cascaded down to state level and they now become responsible for it. So it no longer becomes an issue for the federal government, okay? Thank you very much. Can we take can we take the last question? Can we take? Thank you very much. My name is Adibi Yojo. I had, uh, wanted to ask Commissioner, but I think the last question answers some of the things I wanted to actually highlight. And thank you very much because um, hearing from you now, I can see you took enough time to really work on this amendment, uh, and then we've looked at some of the errors in the first one. Thank you. But I want to make a correction, like the moderator said, uh, so that uh, tomorrow you don't find that uh, we had six great collapse. No, I think I heard when she said we, we had six great collapse. Said, no, we never had up to six. We only had three, two partial and one total. Please, thank you. Th th thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I must. Okay. Can, can, you, can you take a question, please? Can we take. Um... Just about that, while you're while you're holding the mic, sir, there's a question from a member of the audience join us online. Uh, question is for Daffy, Commissioner Daffy. Uh, the, the regulator is taking all the questions, right? It, the question says, is the service-based tariff realistic, bearing in mind the same product has different prices? Bearing in mind that the same commodity, energy has different prices, is a service-based tariff realistic? Okay, um, I, I I think, um, I don't think there's anything more realistic than service-based tariff uh, because what it does, you see, um, we've done this um, thing for so long that yes. what we used to do before was a tariff review was to be done, right? And we would, Throw that review on everybody in the room, regardless of your circumstances. And um, it really hit a soft thumb with Nigerians. And you should also bear in mind that you are now doing reviews on customers who don't even have meters and who are not getting comments rate supply. So so we 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 did consultations. And um, from the consultations we did in 2020, 2021. The feedback we, we got from Nigerians was that we are not going to accept these reviews until we see the power. And the only way you can get the power is by investing. So the reason you have power and some people don't have power is not because someone doesn't like you. It's because 
because adequate investment hasn't been done to ensure that those electrons get to you. So you, you have to look at the, the networks and see, okay, there are certain people who are living in the ideal power scenario in Nigeria today, people who are getting 24 seven. And I'll tell you, my, my, I'm a customer of two discos, um, AADC and ECO. In Abuja, for over seven years, even before we introduced SBT, my supply, except there's a fault, right? I'm on minimum 21, that days is 24, it doesn't blink. You know, when we have issues, okay. But I've been a Bandai customer in Abuja for a long time. In Lagos, I can't say the same, right? Because of different investments done. So how do you get those investments done, right? The people who have reached where you want to go should pay the cost, right? And that enables you invest for the other people who haven't. So the the object, the long play is for everybody to be a band A customer, for everybody to have some power on demand. That the issue is 24, power, 24 hours power doesn't mean you leave your ACs on for 24 hours, right? It means when you want your AC, you want air conditioning, you can put it on and the AC is there. When you don't want it, you switch it off, right? So it now becomes a, a consumer site management issue. So is it realistic? Yes, because the person who has made where investments have been done for you to get an appreciable level of service should pay for that service. And that investment should be made to um, other areas, right? And that's how telecoms was done. The first base stations built in Nigeria, they didn't come to my village to build a base station. And neither did they come to anybody's village here, except your village is Ikoi, right? <laughs> they, 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 you went to where you could invest, right? First of all, those ease of access, you had the non population numbers, and you could make your revenue per base station. And when you're making a revenue per base station, you can build other base stations. So that's what it is, right? So that's, it can't get any more realistic. And you start hearing things like, oh, it is discrimination, it is this, it is that. And you ask yourself that, wait a minute, if it is discrimination, there are parts of Nigeria that you cannot get to because there are no roads. There are places that there is no pipe on water, right? Yes. So you get these things by making the investments, right? And that's what the, the service-based tariff allows you to do that gives the investor a line of sight that where you have invested, you make the highest return, right? And there's a subsidy arrangement. And you take that investment, you invest in the next best place, lift them up, right? And you get your return. And you, that's why MTN today, when they came, they were not the biggest telecoms company in South Africa. But with the investment in Nigeria, they are now bigger than their competitors. Absolutely. And, and it's a great thing that the, the act also provides for cross-subsidization of tariffs as cross-subsidies. Um, uh, thank you very much. Can we quickly take your question, please? And I'm really hoping that the question is not for Commissioner Daffy. It is. Yeah, <laughs> and then, okay, okay. Um, good right. evening. Just... Uh, my name is Shibomi Bajimo. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend the Honorable Commissioner Daffy for the great work he has been doing for the power sector. You know, for some of us that have been there for years, when you came in, we saw positive improvements, especially the way you reviewed a lot of archaic regulations that were in the power sector. So you are doing a very good job and we know that there are potentials for the power sector by the grace of God. Thank Nigeria. you very much. The question, my question, is, the question is, so my question is on electricity theft. That is a major issue in the power sector. Damnela touched on it briefly, but we saw it in, in the news that the federal government wants to establish a tribunal so I just wanted to find out what's the status of that. You know, we've been clamoring for electricity tech ports. 
Is this something that is going to happen very soon? Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank um, you very much. I'm neither the Attorney General or the Minister of Power. <laughs> so so um I, I can't I can't speak on the trajectory of that policy. I'm not, so government is responsible for policy, we're responsible for regulation. But the issue is um you need to create a you need to have sufficient deterrence, right? But deterrence is not the only thing, right? You also need to understand the why are people doing what they are doing, right? And put the right measures in, in place to do that, right? So it's not because, yes, they are caught for... If you steal, you commit murder, they are caught. But some people just broke into a brigadier's house and killed him. Right? Courts exist. Kuja prison is there. They will try you. You understand? So, you, in addition to having your means of deterrence, you have to address the underlying social issues, right? That is leading to that behavior. And you also have to address the issue of um, the productive capacity of of your population, right? Because we like to speak about, oh, 24 seven power, 24 seven power. At the rates today, right? Even wealthy people, right? Are complaining, but it's what it is, right? And we need to be forced to do demand side management, right? To under appreciate that these lights being on is a resource, right? And um, if you're not in the room, switch them off, right? Thank God you don't see tungsten bulbs anymore. Everyone's now using LED to conserve power. All the ACs you find now, inverter. So the more you you do that, right? You, you get people aligned. And um, I, I'm quite, um, I'm, we discussed this in my division group, I think yesterday or two nights ago, uh, this issue of specialized courts, um, I think you are better off empowering your magistracy, your magistrate courts, hmm. whereby, because they are the ones who, it's summary trials uh, and they, they can dispense justice. So you, you train your magistrates, right? Increase the jurisdiction of the um, magistrate courts in the required areas and let them be tasked with this and have adequate uh, identification mechanisms, right? Whereby you can um, identify, okay, this person has done uh, X, right? And he can, you can take him to a magistrate court, he's charged and same day or in a week or so, um, um, the, the matter comes, comes to an end, you understand? Thank you very much. Uh, we have seen, we have seen, um... A, a similar introduction of the small claims courts where dispute burden on small claims are dispensed with, with the speed of lightning. Uh, so if that can be implemented to addressing energy theft, I think that will go a long way. Um, I've, I've seen, I've not seen any questions for Dami Lola, so Dami, just a quick one. Um, people tend to be mistaken that the Electricity Act is the first time that where, where the states are able to, I mean, meddle in this sector, uh, but, but that is not the case. Um, states have been able to generate, transmit, and distribute in areas not covered by the national grid. So what was on the exclusive list was for areas covered by the grid. And we have seen some state activity in the past. Um, Lagos was earlier licensed by NERC. Um, Rivers IPP was there, which was later sold to the owners of Airbnb Power. Um, Edo State Government played an active role in Azura. Uh, so some might argue that the states have been able to play in this sector as licensees, um, and they've been able to regulate areas not not covered by the grid, but yet they have done so little in rural electrification. Uh, so can we can we really trust them with with grid connected electricity? Okay, and thank you very much for that question. And um, this is the way I look at it is. Not all states don't have the same financial capacity, and that's the truth of it. I think the best way to look at it would be to put states in buckets. Um, some states 
would already have existing laws. Some states don't have. Some states would decide whether they are ready. Some states don't would decide whether for now it's not their priority. So according to those uh, buckets, each state can you know tailor what plan works for them. Now in terms of renewables, yes, um, I think it's is the general theme in Nigeria whereby there's been so much focus on fossil fuels and um thermal generation and all of that. But yes, um, there's a vision to infuse renewables into electricity generation. And the way to do that is um the electricity act has also, you know, sort of now made the statutory, which is find a way each state to whatever they are doing, ensure that they one collaborate with the agencies involved as REA, and then they can also collaborate with other private sector. Many of these mini grids that you have, many mini grids are using, um, you have mini grids that are solar powered and all of that. So those are good areas for the state to look into. Like I said earlier, renewables were not, uh, there was so much focus on thermal and all of that, but it's, it's good. This is a good thing now with the electricity act also, you know, having statutory provisions. And I hope that states would take advantage of that. Thank you very much for, for that quick one. Um, we have someone online wants to ask a question. Uh, can, can you can you patch him through, please? Can, can we bring him on so he can ask a question? While we had that, um, there is a there is a question. I I'm inclined to avoid it because it's it's targeted at Commissioner Daffy. But then I think <laughs> so. Yes, but, but but I think we can we can take it. How will the regulatory interventions handle technological gaps in NESI, considering the incorporation of the ISO? Can the ISO fully function? in these technological gaps. Uh, this is coming from Engineer Adesola. Uh, how can we leverage technological interventions and can the ISO really function uh, amidst those technological gaps that we have in transmission? Okay, so um, the, the um, reason why we are going towards an ISO is for governance and transparency, right? So let's be clear on that. But the issue of the, so the ISO would, would perform the way the SO is performing. But we intend for the ISO to be better because the technology that the system operator needs is a SCADA system. SCADA system, yeah. And the um, procurement has been done, the project is going on, and hopefully we hope that this time around, Nigeria will have um, a well-functioning SCADA that support our system operations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have do we have the online? Okay. Can you put him through, please? If you can hear us, can you can you quickly introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Uh, all right. Uh, good evening, uh, Honorable Commissioner. Good evening, the host and um, the panelists and everybody. My name is Zanna Hashemi. Uh, I, 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 I work uh, with uh, Disco in the industry. Now, uh, my question, I think uh, somebody um, uh, asked uh, about uh, the band A and a tariff increase issue. Now, uh, what I want to contribute is, uh, for, uh, from my experience, what people are concerned about uh, the increase is, you know, if, if a band A feeder, uh, uh, I mean, uh, per kilowatt hour, you're charged uh, 206 uh, naira. Uh, the concern of Nigerians is uh, that under the same feeder, you will have the well-to-do that can pay without, uh, I mean, batting an eyelid. And then, at the, uh, because naturally, the, 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 you, you do not uh, design how, who's, who and who stays under the same feeder. You will still have 
people uh, with, um, uh, how do I call it, um, very low purchasing power, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even the poor of the poor under the same feeder. Now, the discos are compelled to, uh, to collect, uh, I mean, to charge the same. So that is what Nigerians are, are, are concerned about. Uh, but I, I think I, 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 I had a technical problem when uh, the commissioner was responding to that. I don't know what, uh, if, if there's anything the commissioner can understand. And then the second question is around uh, the energy theft. Uh, I mean, uh, now there, there's, there are two types of energy theft. Now, if a prepaid customer uh, bypasses, uh, that's, that's a clear energy theft. Uh, but you have postpaid customers uh, that will uh, refuse to pay. When you disconnect them, uh, they reconnect themselves back using uh, illegal, uh, what we call NEPA two in in the industry. Yeah, so 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 uh, you know you 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 get them uh, arrested and then uh, you know what 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 does the act uh, say about that? How how do how how can um, uh, the honourable commissioner? Like shed some light on 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 what uh, best was the best way to 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 approach those kind of issues. Thank you. Thank thank you very much, um, Commissioner. To 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 cap it up, uh, I mean you can find low income and high income customers on the same feeder, so there is trouble when it comes to implementing the you know the band rates. Uh, so how do we address that? Uh, second the question of energy theft. For the second aspect of the question, I think there's an incentive for the disco to install, provide prepared meters to, to avoid all of that. But then I think you can take the question, sir, very quickly. Okay, so um, the I I think we, we need to be um, very clear in our mind that the issue of bands has nothing to do with your Feeder. economic circumstance nothing to do whatsoever so it's not a um, rich versus poor um elite versus mm -mm. and he rightly said it feeders run and um true the man who has it so it's like the portion of the bible that says the lord causes the rain to fall on the home of the poor and, <laughs> and, and the rich yes <laughs> right so so th that that rain that rain falls right what we need to do now is one issue of education on demand side management. It's not power to for you to just leave your learn how to use your resources, right? And um, when the telecoms when we're still paying fifteen dollars per minute, many people couldn't call, wouldn't call you. They would flash you, and what betide you if you picked that call on one second, they would be so pissed that why did you pick the call? Yeah, sure. You understand? And when they would call you, we would curtail our conversations to one minute. And you would call, Daddy, I need this, 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 and this, and this. I didn't hear you. No, 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 Daddy, I said this and this. And cut. Or they would call you and say, call me back. Mm. You understand? <laughs> but now, do people do that anymore? No. No. Right? And you find that that's the people who work with you, who you give money, they spend time on the phone. They are talking and talking and talking and because it's mm. it's 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 prices have dropped. So it's an education thing, right? It's not an elite or mm -mm, right. Investments have been made to radiate feeders with certain levels of reliability, right? People need to, you now need to start educating people that. Look, if you do this, you will reduce your consumption, right? Switch this off if you're not in the room. Um, you don't have to set your AC to, you know, we all set our AC to 16. Yes. And when you set your AC to 16, it means the compressor is going off, coming on, going off, coming on, going off, coming on, right? If you set it to 22 or so, it stays, when it gets to 22, it just goes off yeah. and comes on when the temperature in the room Get higher, get higher than, so it's yeah. keeping it at 22. So it's just little, little things we need to do for, for education, right? Um, energy theft. Uh, uh, so on the issue, so so getting people to understand energy theft, the law is clear, right? The law is clear. 
Um, first of all, the utilities need to educate their staff because we see that, and he mentioned it in his own remarks in Nepal too, a lot of the staff, <laughs> people working for discos, right, are the ones. Many years ago, my mom's residence in Lagos was the first place of what is now a Keja disco where they installed prepaid meters. The man who came to install our prepaid meter was telling us that, uh -huh, we can separate your water heater from this. So only oh. lights will be on the meter. You understand? So it is the people who are working with the that. And if, so a lot of work starts in-house, right? Then you need to do technology, use technology, right? To monitor, monitor behavior patterns. And now with artificial intelligence and, and tools for analytics, you can see who is vending, who is not vending, the profile of the house, and you send them, you get people going to patrol this area at night, right? If you see the lights on, uh -uh, then you know that you're coming to uh, do further um, investigation. So when you you take possession, right? That's why the law says possession is 90% of the law. Yeah. It's not just ownership. When you take possession of your network, you let people know that this is my power. I'm not going to let you misuse it. Misuse I'm not it. going to let you understand. And that also comes with the responsibility of you being responsive to customers, right? You saying, oh, seeing a um, feeder panel that is open, you coming to repair it. You understand? You monitoring your network, right? People now start to appreciate the fact that you're no longer NEPA, right? That yeah. this is a new entity that is ready to do things differently. Absolutely. So to 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 cap it up, um, one thing that to to sum it up, your 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 contributions on the the you know the 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 tariff the tariff discrimination the tariff differences. I think simply put, it is a service reflective tariff, not an income reflective tariff or a status reflective tariff. Thank you very much indeed for for that intervention. Just um, taking the final question. Uh, still for Commissioner Daphne. Uh, Thank you uh, very much. So what, what we we'll do is, um, I, Osefran or Damilola, either of you can can endeavour to answer this question on behalf of NEC. So, what is NEC doing to make dispensing of meters by discourse corruption free? One is asked to pay. One is asked to pay a gunde to get meters. So I think what Akin is trying to say is what is what is NEC doing to ensure that the the process of rolling out and installing meters uh, without having to pay a gunde to, to get meters is corruption free, is transparent and corrupt free. That that you don't buy you, you don't um sort okay. of tip your way off to, to get a meter. Okay, so the point is um we've done um all that we can do with the processes, right? Um but I'm not God. Right, sure. and um, we we live. You have to take cognizance of the human condition, right? And we are in Nigeria, right? So, if where you do enough um, education, you you take out the cash interface. You rely on technology. And you encourage people to, if first of all, you put means of identification, right? So everybody knows that uh, I am Daffy from X Disco, right? And my details are clearly embezzled on how I'm moving about, mm. right? Mm. And you encourage people to whistleblow, you create channels for review, right? You start to bring about more accountability. Right, but in a scenario whereby you have scarcity, um, uh, people uh, are complaining about the price of the product, there will be avenues to, to cut corners. And regardless of your best efforts, right, someone is always going to make a demand and stuff. But we have to have accountability frameworks in place. And this comes from at the utility side downstream, right? You need to, you need to put steps in place that hold their staff accountable. And where a, one of my bosses told me many years ago, 
if you do not reward the right behavior, human beings will adopt the behavior that is rewarded. So sure. where people aren't being fired and there's no consequences for, for bad behavior, it will continue. Understand? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that um, quick clarification. And I think that uh, people are, are placing necessary expectations on the regulator. The regulator can regulate, provide the enabling environment, but some of the problems that we see in the sector are really operational. Uh, so, and I understand that in Nigeria, the more the, the, the more effective you are as a regulator, uh, the more people, the public expects you to descend to the arena and go beyond your regulatory powers. Um, so discourse, good corporate governance, um, uh, you know, anti-corruption practices, internal control, enforcement. I think that's kind of the way to go. Uh, can you tip in 30 seconds? Uh, it's very important that these schools also um, educate their staff on the implication and the impact of these things in the long run. Because um, where you should change investments, you also, in a way, um, limit development, right? So if investors cannot um, recover their return, their investments, then you have less investments, right? And then you have um, unreliable power supply as well. And then you have losses as well. So you have to educate your staff. I see that you know some of them do capacity um, trainings here and there, but you need to educate them. And like um, Commissioner said, really analyze. Um, I've called. I mean, I've had to call customer care services of um, learning discos, and sometimes I can imagine if I had a, an urgent complaint to lay, and no one is responding, or what I'm, you know, complaining about is not being acted upon as fast as I want them to. So there is that process. And in addition to brilliant, brilliant one, yes. Stefan. Brilliant one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think um members of the audience, you can always approach any of the panelists to to carry this forward. Uh th thank you very much. At this point, may I invite our esteemed panelists for, for their closing remarks? And then I'm going to do a recap of some of the discussion points. That's the toughest part of this job, <laughs> moderating. So please, um Damilola, can we start with you? Just your closing remarks in two minutes. Okay. Um. So first, first of all, I'll say that um the power sector has been, I think, since the passing of the Electricity Act, has been busy. Um. And kudos to NEC. There's been a lot of stakeholder engagement, and there's a lot of other activities, even areas like um what should happen to NBET, how should the state transition. So there's a lot happening, and what I would say is. I do hope that um in in another year from now, hopefully the NIEPSIP would also be out before the end of the year. I'm hoping that that would also, you know, give clarity on the government's position and what they really want for the power sector so that everybody, all stakeholders can tap into that and also align their own plans with the objective that the the, old con the objective that the government has for the country. Thank you very much. Can you can you appreciate her, please? Can you give her a round of applause? Thank you, thank you. Osefan, can you can can you take your closing remarks, please? Um, for me, I would say um, energy is power is a lifeline of any economy. Um, if you have power, then you are able to develop, and um, no nation can develop in the dark, right? And no nation can grow or become what it's supposed to be in the dark. Um, so I would say, yes, investors should come into the sector. Um, because we, I mean, we need that investment, but I'd also encourage government to continue what he has already started, which is um, frameworks and laws, regulations that are investor friendly, right? Frameworks that also do not, um, that remove some certain bottlenecks. Um, states should also make those laws that encourage investors to come to the state. Collaboration is very important. Um, sensitization is very important. It's possible for us to have um a reliable and adequate power supply. It's also possible to have a financially sustainable and viable electricity market. But this would not, this cannot be done isolatedly, right? We need a lot of um, collaborations. We also need um, state governments, in fact, federal governments to focus on regulating and less on ownership, right? Um, take, for example, what um, the Abia State has done with the um, ABA integrated power projects, right? Abia okay. State just has 3.5% in that. And for some of the discos, you still have government having about 40% stake thereabouts with investments that are not even yielding dividends for you. So 
I mean, focus on regulating and let the market players play and let the market determine the price. As long as you give power that is reliable, that is predictable, that is adequate, people will buy, you know, and renewable energy is very key. I like that we've started going in that direction and I think that we should continue to encourage that. And for Nigerians like you and like me, <laughs> you listening here, I would say that um, as government makes this effort, you know, as government sensitizes, let us also, you know, take it upon ourselves to encourage this effort and not frustrate them. Because if you frustrate, it's not just you that it impacts, it impacts every other person. And I mean, be like me, since the band A tariff, like what commission I said, now I've realized that, you know, the weather is not so, it's not so cold. <laughs> Sorry, it's not so hot anymore. So my AC is, barely on my windows yeah. are now used to being open right i've realized that i don't really need hot water as much you know <laughs> so to make certain changes here and there and i mean these things are achievable but we need to work together and i know that our goal is possible it's a decentralized market now come in and play come in and play and thank, you. Thank, thank you Osefan. thank you Osefan. thank you yourself i like i like the point you made that if nigerians have access to reliable and accessible electricity companies will operate at a cost structure that is competitive. And that means uh, there are less, less um, forex outflows for the importation of foreign products. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that intervention. And finally, uh, at this point, we move to Commissioner Dafe for your final thoughts, okay, for so your uh, final remarks. I, I, as you rightly said, the, the power sector is the future of Nigeria. And, um, and I, I would dare say from from a from an opportunity and um, untapped resource standpoint, I think we have the largest market in the world for anything, right? Um, there's no there's no country that has our demographics that has the same need we have for everything, right? We need more generation capacity. We need more transmission capacity. We need more distribution capacity. We need meters. We need people with with skills so um i i dare say that it's it's the future um and um the the best time i've gotten it right was yesterday the next best time is now so um there's there's room there's there's room to to do to do it um from a career standpoint i, I think anyone who is thinking of charting a career you can't go wrong by having skills in this sector. You can't go wrong. Um, for lawyers, I tell all the young lawyers that this is the way to go because there are very few lawyers that can negotiate a PPA, that can explain the issues, the nuances of, of the power sector. Yes. New University in Nigeria does regulatory economics, which is no. what you need for. So, so there are skills, and um, you, if you invest in it, you would, you would get a return. And we have that achievement of we built something. We, we went from here to there, and I had a role in doing that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done in this sector. Um, many thanks indeed for, for your availability to speak at every given opportunity. Uh, thanks for your continued mentorship to young people. would like to appreciate you for, for coming here today, despite your very, very tight schedule. Can, can you give him a louder applause, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have the unfortunate responsibility of doing a recap of all that's been said here today. Um, I hope I don't do a terrible job at that. Uh, first, Commissioner Daffy really spoke a lot. Um, he took us down memory lane the advancement of the power sector, the 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 NACI, uh, pre pre privatization, the enactment of the NEPP, the business model that inspires the enactment of the electric power sector reform in two thousand and five down to privatization, and ultimately culminating to the enactment of the Electricity Act. He noted that we're not there yet, but uh, the act is very very promising. And one significant improvement that's been brought by the Act is that it allowed regulators to assert their regulatory responsibilities. Regulators are now empowered to deploy the tools at their disposal to 
stabilize the market and inject efficiency in the market. Um, the Electricity Act um, is now being is now the legal is now the legislation that provides for the legal and institutional framework for the Nigerian electricity supply industry. Uh, it had achieved decentralization. It had harmonized the various pieces of legislations that govern the power sector into one single comprehensive act. Um, and that investors care really care less about laws and regulations because we have enough of them. What they care about are government and political risks. And he mentioned the need to really address, to curtail, to mitigate, or to transfer government and political risks uh, as a step to attract investment. Um, the need for guaranteed returns on investment and the need for cost reflective tariffs and service reflective tariffs for investors in the sector. Um, he spoke about the significant cost structure that underpins the generation of every single unit of electricity in Nigeria. Uh, as anywhere in the world, uh, he stressed on the need for the ability of the electricity market to evolve and set tariffs that work for them based on their own needs. Um, he mentioned speaking about the ISO, that the ISO was, TCN was unbundled and the ISO was established to inject transparency in the market, primarily in transmission. Um, and that SCADA apparatus have been procured and that SCADA and the infusing of technology, infusion of technology is going to transform this, this sector to the levels that we all aspire for the sector to be. Uh, thank you very much for, for your contributions, for your thoughts. Um, and once again, we, we cannot thank you enough for finding it out of your tight schedule to come here and join us and speak to us. Uh, moving to Osefan, I'm going to abridge it for, for the paucity of time. Uh, Osefan spoke to the inconsistency in policy as hampering investment in the power sector. Uh, she stressed on the need to ramp up generation sources from all the available fuel sources that we have in our mix. Um, she spoke to the need for states to attract and retain investors through market feasibility, market mastery, providing incentives on renewable energy products such as um, import duty waivers, zero duty regimes on solar apparatus, for example. We've had some back and forth about that, you know. Uh, uh, access to human capital development, knowledge transfer, um, mentorship, and capacity building for professionals in the sector, and most of all, access to land for investors in the power sector at the state level. Uh, thank you very much, Osefan. Thank you for, for your insights. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for, for all that you are and all that you're doing in the sector. And most of all, thanks for sparing your time to come here and speak to our audience. Thank you. Can you give a round of applause, please? Finally, finally, um, Damilola spoke to the need to deal with transmission constraints, transmission and distribution constraints, um, the sector being a value chain that needs for all organs of the chain to work. Uh, she spoke to the need to ramp up generation capacity, leveraging on all the available fuel sources and diversifying our energy mix, having a combination of um, thermal sources, thermal plant, renewable energy sources. She spoke to the ability of the state under the new Electricity Act, the ability of the state to generate power from based on abundant fuel sources that works for them. She spoke to the, the need for leveraging distribution as a low-hanging fruit, uh, issues around metering, the use of technology, local enforcement, um, the enforcement of energy theft, uh, and other allied matters in distribution. Uh, as far as she's concerned, for the energy sector to work, we have to address the constraints in distribution uh, as the major collector, probably for the on behalf of the entire value chain. Um, uh, distribution is a low hanging fruit. She she spoke to the series of incentives that can be put in place by state governments to attract and retain investment in the power sector post decentralization. Uh, such incentives include tax waivers, zero duty exemptions, 
and so on and so forth. I'd like to thank you very much, our esteemed panelists, for, for coming here today. It's been a very interesting panel. It's been an excellent panel to our audience. You've been a very amazing audience, uh, both those who have joined us physically here and those who have joined online. Uh, many thanks indeed to the Electricity Hub, to Next Year Power, Next Year Advisory, for putting this together. Uh, it's been a long way coming, and thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to yield the floor to my guy at the top. <laughs> I think that's... Please, another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. It was really enlightening. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here. And a round of applause to yourselves, our audience, and those online as well. Thank you for coming out of your busy schedules. Please do well to network, take your refreshments, and see you at the 96th Power Dialogue in July. Interestingly, it's going to be our eighth anniversary, so please don't miss it. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we draw the curtain, uh, I think, can we have a group photograph? Okay. Can we, can we take this off, please?